This is the number one mistake people make whenever they look for a new car. So don't do this. Here's a hint and some thinking music. The hint starts with an L, ends with a T. I'm Jim Logan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Yes. But Australia only do like poor. Look at me. I'm only human, clearly, at best. Website. Card. The answer is, of course, lust. They fall in lust. It weaponizes their confirmation bias. They fixate on a particular car. <laughs> And they think I've got to have it. So they go and look for confirmation in the form of glowing reviews. And let's face it, all reviews are glowing reviews. A manufacturer won't invite you back to the next launch event, as a journalist, unless you produce pretty much glowing reviews. That's the unspoken deal. So it's very easy to fall into this trap. I've got a real-life example here, which is essentially a picture of a person skipping down the track through a freaking minefield. And I want to break it right down for you so that when you need a new car, you don't do this, because that often ends in disaster. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. The internet is so useful, of course, but also a bit risky. You use it every day, so you've got to protect yourself from cyber criminals, scammers and hackers. NordVPN is a great way to do that. It's simple and effective. You just subscribe, you download the app and you connect. One click later, you are better protected. Your IP address is shielded from scammers and your online traffic is masked with state-of-the-art encryption across as many as six devices. That's especially useful if you don't want anyone else, including your ISP, your employer, or even the government looking over your shoulder while you're online. You don't want your employer watching you applying for a job at a competitor, for example. That could get awkward. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC right now and you'll get a huge discount plus up to four additional months free and a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. I'll put a link in the description. NordVPN is the fastest VPN on earth and it costs only about as much as a cup of coffee every month to keep your data, your identity and your devices secure. Because your location is masked, you'll be able to access streaming and other services that might be geo-blocked where you live. Plus, you can continue to watch your favourite content when you travel overseas. All up, it's a pretty small price to pay for enhanced cybersecurity and greater access to this and that online. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now to get more secure and enjoy a juicy discount plus those extra months of free subscription time. It's totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. And thanks to Nord for sponsoring this episode. Not going to name this person because that would be unfair and quite also possibly defamatory. And we wouldn't want that. So we'll just call them, I don't know, Trev. Trev says, hi, dog's dick. Gotta love a hi with a dog's dick after it. Exclamation points are only for shouting. Just saying. I like the Ford. <coughs> I like the Ford. Puma, but I can't find a review of it on the website. Maybe that's telling you something, Trev. Oh no, auto expert, I think he means me, thinks Ford is going down the toilet. We'll get to that, not really. But everywhere I've looked, the Puma gets a great review. I also like the car. And if de de, I v. I don't know what that means. If de de, we been driving a low Clums B250 2012 three pronger. Point me to a review if there is one. Okay, Trev. That's a very interesting way to look at purchasing a new car. You've got to get your objective hat on, right? I get that you have to fall in lust to some degree. You have to be motivated about it. You have to like the car. I get that. But there are objectively good 
cars and objectively bad cars. It's not just the cars. There's objectively good reasons to buy a car and objectively bad reasons. And the real challenge here is to get some objectively good reasons to line up with a car that you're prepared to devote whatever amount of lust you need to get yourself across the line. Okay, this is kind of important. The way I'd break this down even further is to say, you know when somebody, typically some middle-aged dipshit, happily married, with a home, kids, everything's on track, and then they decide that it's a good idea to perform mouth-to-mouth CPR kind of thing on Tiffany, the boss's secretary in the spa in the bathroom at home. And this can be, of course, completely innocent when one's wife arrives home a day early from a business trip and discovers this has been going on. You can make all sorts of uh, representations about it. It's not what it seems. (laughs) Ask me how I know. But it's really a disaster, and everyone around you can tell that this is a disaster waiting to happen, okay? Everyone knows. And the reason you don't know is because you're viewing this through the telescope of lust, whereas everybody else is looking at this more or less objectively with concern for you in mind, right? And buying a car is exactly the same process, but without the same profound consequences of losing the house and the savings and only getting to see your kids with a court order and all of that kind of thing, right? So don't make this mistake in the automotive domain, is what I'm saying, okay? Just throttle the last back on the car thing up front. So let's just do that. Now, Ford is not going down the toilet, okay? That's important. I don't say that Ford's going down the toilet commercially. They're actually doing brilliantly with the Ranger and its derivative, the Everest, and they're kind of doing okay with the Transit Custom as well, which is reasonably popular in that sort of small segment of vans, right? But... Everything else in Ford's inventory is a joke. It, like, it really is a joke. And if Ranger ever fell over for Ford, they'd be unsustainable commercially in this country. They're a one-horse race, essentially, or at least all the other horses are really just uh, corgis with saddles, and they can't win the race, you know what I mean? They're just duds, and Puma is a dud, frankly. Even though... It's a nice car. We'll get to my review on it. I'll do a review on the Puma now, shall I? It's a reasonably safe, in fact, it's a very safe, nice, zippy car, and I'm sure it's got competitive features and it drives okay, so yay. But that's not a reason to drive the car, because Ford has a reprehensible record on customer support, and it's also pretty dismal on reliability. And you don't want to jump into bed with those two factors just because you're in lust with the metal over here. So that's a real problem, okay? This is a real problem for you if you go down this track. And I'm not just shit-canning the Puma, although I am about to shit-can it royally. Don't you worry. You won't be disappointed. But there are plenty of vehicles like this, most of them wearing, you know, Jeep badges or Land Rover badges or Volkswagen badges or Mercedes-Benz va- badges and badges. I've never seen a Mercedes-Benz badge. I hope that never changes. So here's the thing, right? Puma is manufactured in, can you guess? Guess. Think of Car manufacturing powerhouses around the world, powerhouse countries of automotive manufacture, and just then go at the absolute other end of the frickin' spectrum, because that's where the Puma comes from. Have you guessed? Romania. Okay, Romania is really interesting, and you've got to ask yourself, why would the Blue Oval put a car factory in Romania? And I'm not being a racist about this at all. This is not about race. This is about culture, and there's some really interesting things about Romanian culture that you need to know, because Ford has this awesome record of operating in countries like Romania. We'll get to that in just a sec as well. And you really need to know this, and you will not hear any other motoring journalist, at least in Australia, tell you this story, because A, they want to keep going on the launches, and B, they wouldn't freaking know, because they're car reviewers and not journalists. So... It's the only Romanian manufactured car in Australia, okay? The Puma. So there's a dude named Nicolae Sulescu, 
who was the top commie in Romania in between 1965 and 1989, which is pretty much recent history when you think about it. it sets the tone for that country, basically. So he was El Dictator there for, uh, what was that, 24 years. And that went really well for Nikolai, Big Nick, until the very end. I guess you'd have to say, didn't go that well for him at the end because he and wifey were actually executed by firing squad and it was for, among other things, genocide by starvation, okay? recent history this is like if you're my age this is when you were going to school dude in Romania Big Nick was running the joint and starving people to death committing genocide by starvation so yay anyway that firing squad uh, relief of the burden for Romania took place on the 22nd of December 1989 so Merry Christmas rest of Romania and uh, these days of course uh, Romania is really good for, if you wanted a horse meat Big Mac, I think that would be possible, potentially, who would know? And uh, number 29 in corruption in Europe, okay? So there are 28 less corrupt countries you could visit as a tourist or set up a factory as a car maker, but 29 in corruption today. Okay, so I guess if you were marketing Romania from an attractiveness point of view, you could say, visit Romania. We're slightly less corrupt than Kosovo or Serbia. Yes. Great. So well done. And they, uh, So fast forward from the firing squad execution of Big Nick and the number 29 in terms of corruption in Europe to today. And the, the, the top ranking thing, that Romania does. It's number five for diaspora, right? That's also a literacy test. Can you guess what diaspora is? It's essentially when your homegrown population fucks off somewhere else permanently, or in the case of Romanians, anywhere else, right? Because it's that good. In other words, today, Romania is number five on the list of countries where its citizens can't wait to get out. That's got to tell you something, okay? So the reason I mention this is if you're a car maker, why do you want to set up a factory in a really corrupt country that everyone wants to get out of if they're born here? And there are only two answers, right? The answer number one is it's cheap, so we're saving money. We're not actually here because the country's got a fantastic track record of building world-class cars and we want some of that action. It's because it's cheap and also because Ford has an incredible history of setting up operations in countries just like that and exploiting the shit out of everything they can when they're there. And just to justify this commentary, because I know some people are going to be incensed by it, I'm going to read you a BBC report about Ford doing a similar thing in Argentina, okay? This is from the BBC, which last time I looked was a fairly credible news organisation, and this reeks of being well-researched. You can find it online anyway, you know, just Google the keywords. In October 2002, a federal prosecutor in Argentina filed a criminal complaint against the executives of Ford Motor Argentina, which is also famous. Like Argentina is famous for corruption, right? It's like South America's Romania. It's The parallels are astounding. Anyway, alleging that the company collaborated with the 1976 to 1983 military dictatorship, the complaint accused Ford of helping the regime in political repression, abductions and mistreatment of Ford's workers and union organisers. These abuses allegedly took place on the company's premises. Argentina's third federal court initiated the criminal investigation in November of 2002. Following this investigation in December of 2006, the public prosecutor charged that the military operated a detention centre within Ford's factory complex, like holy shit, Batman, and that the company officials helped Argentinian officials kidnap 25 company employees and trade union leaders who were later illegally detained and tortured. Like, 
fuck's sake. This is how they rolled. In response to the charges, Ford's spokesman said that the company asked for army protection because it was targeted by gorillas. He means the human kind. But denied that this led to the establishment of a, quote, detention centre. So after that, there was all this legal wrangling, which culminated after a bit of fast forwarding. In May 2013, three former Ford executives were indicted for crimes against humanity. Like, following the criminal investigation that began 11 years earlier, the three men were accused of giving names, ID numbers, pictures and home addresses to security forces who hauled two dozen union workers off the floor of Ford's factory in suburban Buenos Aires to be tortured and interrogated and then sent to military prisons. The trial began in December 2017 after having been postponed twice. One of the three executives who was accused, died in the time between the beginning of the investigation and the trial. Two hearings were held in December of 2017, during which 12 of the 24 workers still alive testified. The other two former Ford executives, Pedro Muller and Hector Francisco Sibilla, were not present. So well done them. On the 20th of February 2018, the San Martin Federal Oral Court, never been to oral court, Sounds like a fairly confronting place, doesn't it? In Argentina began the public hearing against two former Ford Motor Argentina executives, two former Ford factory workers witnessed during the trial, alleging Ford had a clandestine detention centre inside the factory where 24 workers were kidnapped and tortured between March and April of 1976. On the 11th of December of 2018, the court announced its verdict. The two former Ford executives were convicted for abduction and torture of 24 workers and sentenced to 10 and 12 years, respectively. So what's happened since? This is fairly recent. Like This is in 2018, OK, when the sentences were handed down. So Ford's gone on this ridiculous PR offensive where they basically have this document now. It's called... Ford Motor Company Global Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Transparency Statement for the financial year ending on the 31st of December 2022. You can look this up. Now, what astounds me is the name of this report. Like, if, if you're going to be doing modern slavery and human trafficking, you'd at least want to be transparent about it. So it's a shit name. And the fact that a report such as this is even necessary just... It gobsmacks me. In fact, Ford, I'd have to say, Ford is the Hannibal Lecter, one of the Hannibal Lecters of the automotive industry, the way they have engaged in these abhorrent practices, crimes against humanity. You know, they've got form when it comes to setting up operations in places where the rules don't really matter. And when you look at how they comport themselves in Australia, like Ford's attitude in Australia is consumer law, who needs it? It's just for toasters, right? This is like a reflection of their conduct in Argentina. Those mother lovers will get away with whatever they're allowed to get away with in any market. So you're in lust with the puma, okay? Bringing this back to the point of relevance here, do you really want to be in bed with a company so distant from its moral compass? Like, do you really? It can't even, it couldn't find its moral compass with a mirror and both hands, dude. Come on. So there's that. There's also the commercial performance of the Puma. Like, Mazda sells five CX3s for every Puma. And uh, the Kia Stonic and the Hyundai Venue also massively outsell it. So this tells me that in the popular consciousness, when you look at uh, when you look at the Puma and the market, people are going, "No, nah, I'll take a CX3, dude, or I'll take a Venue, or I'll take a Stonic, right?" Like they just are. Puma in 2022, 2,400 sales. Okay, CX3 almost 12,000. Kia Stonic almost 8,600. 
the Aris Cross, about 8,400 from Australia's leading provider of misleading automotive deception there. Oh, what a feeling. And Hyundai Venue, 6,400. So they all massively outsell the Puma. And why do you care about that if you're looking across the bar at the Puma and falling in last? Well, popularity is a thing that really matters at resale time because less popular cars tend to depreciate like stuck friggin' pigs, whereas the more popular cars tend to hold their resale value better. So you're also setting yourself up for a financial disaster at trade-in time if you buy a Puma. And this is why last just sucks, basically. Now, I get that there is a huge subjective dimension to buying a car and you have to be in lust as well as lining up, you know, the objective factors in your favour. But everything is so wrong about the Puma, as I see it, on fundamentals. And it's not about how it drives. Like, if you look at a review of the Puma, it's going to say, yeah, it drives okay. It's got some nice features. And here's the space. Here's me sitting in the back seat. My knees don't touch the driver's seat. And it's got door pockets in the... It's got door pockets for the whatever, and it's got pockets in the back of the seat. There's a USB here, and there's whatever. Maybe there's some air vents. Probably not. I don't know. I don't want to drive a Puma. I'd... What's second price, you know? <laughs> the, the bottom line is... Reviews are structured to be positive because that's what car makers want to hear. The reviewer is not doing it for you. He's doing it for the car maker. He wants to keep borrowing cars, flying up the pointy end of the plane, going on the gigs, right? This is how this works. So I'm pretty sure it drives okay. And how it drives, here's the pro tip about how it drives. If you're not in the market for a performance car, then the car you want is going to drive okay. It's not like the 70s or the 80s where there were some dead set pigs to drive. Not like that at all. If you're buying a medium SUV, a small SUV, seven seat SUV, they all drive okay. They really do. Like that's, that's the bar. The bar is, do they drive okay? Answer, yeah. Some of them might drive slightly better, some of them might drive slightly worse, but if you're not a driving pervert like me, then does it really matter to your average driver who really can't tell the difference between the way a CX-5 and a Tucson and a Sportage drive, for example, do you really care? Answer, no, because they're all okay. What you really want to do is avoid the bad choices, and the bad choices are predicated on things like underlying culture of the car maker, whether they're going to support you if there's a problem, how popular the bloody thing is so it does value doesn't fall off a cliff after three years of ownership or something, and things of that nature. Also, the more popular cars typically have a larger spare parts inventory in the country, and they have more trained technicians in dealerships because there's more of them around. They need more parts and they need more hands on them to service them. So there's more training. And that's all pretty positive as well. So if I was in the market for a tiny little SUV, I'd be buying a CX-3 forthwith because its value is going to be better, the support's going to be better, Mazda's culture is better than Ford's, blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm kind of happy to help someone buy a Puma. Like, if you really want a Puma because I don't know you identify as a big cat, then happy to help you with the Puma, dude. But if you're just a mainstream car buyer and you want to make the best choice, and it doesn't, it's not about SUVs, it's not about tiny SUVs or medium SUVs, whatever category of vehicle you decide to choose, whatever price point you establish for yourself, then you can go mining the market for which vehicles qualify right? They've got to be in that category and they've got to be inside your budget, basically. And then you mine the market and you pick out cars that you think you might like before lust takes over and just grabs you, as it were. Just have a think about the objective factors that really matter because you're not just buying the car, you're getting married to that brand. And I've got to say, in the case of Ford, Land Rover, Jeep, Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, etc. The dud car makers, in other words. When it comes to them, the marriage is often much worse 
than the expectations set up within you by the lust up front.